afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's panel. I can see that the number of participants is continuing to increase, but I'm going to begin with an introduction whilst others join. The title for the session today is Latest Developments in the Extraterritorial Application of Human Rights Law. We are privileged to have with us three distinguished speakers. Before I introduce them and their topics, I just want to thank the convener of this panel, Kristen Hausler, who is the Dorset Senior Research Fellow in Public International Law and Director of the Centre for International Law at Bickel. Um, I also want to thank Liam Strachan for all his help in putting this event together. We are going to hear in turn from our three speakers who will speak for around 15 minutes each and we will then have at least that much time for Q&A. And please do feel free as the event continues to ask questions as we go along and I will gather up the questions and be asking them to the panelists at the end of their presentations. Our first speaker is Dr. Oral Sari, who is an Associate Professor of Public International Law at the University of Exeter, where he is the Director of the Exeter Centre for International Law. Dr. Sari has published widely on the law of armed conflict, status of forces agreements, peace support operations, international human rights law, and the legal aspects of hybrid warfare. In addition to teaching, he lectures regularly on international law and military operations in the UK and abroad. He will be speaking to us today about those aspects of the Overseas Operations Bill, which touch on the issue of extraterritoriality. Our second speaker is Ralph Wilde. He is a member of the Faculty of Laws at UCL, where he teaches international law, international human rights law, the law on the use of force, and a course called Decolonizing Law, which is a critical treatment of the relationship between law and race imperialism, colonialism, and post-colonialism. His research focuses on these issues as well as the subject of today's event, which Ralph is working on as part of his Human Rights Beyond Borders project. Ralph will be speaking to us today about the recent Grand Chamber judgment in the case of Georgia and Russia. And as many of you will have seen, there has also been another recent Grand Chamber judgment, Hanan against Germany, which we can hopefully discuss in the Q&A. Our final speaker is Dr. Lea Riblet. She is a lecturer in public law at the University of Glasgow and has written on the extraterritorial application of human rights, human rights adjudication and participatory democracy and the theory and practice of referendums. She is the author of Human Rights Unbound, a theory of extraterritoriality, which is published by OUP. She will be speaking about the Committee on the Rights of the Child's recent decisions that France has jurisdiction over the rights of children with French nationality held in camps for suspected ISIL supporters in northern Syria. So with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Sari, first of all, to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here today and to talk about the Overseas Operations Bill. You just give me one second, I will share my screen with you to share some slides. So let me do that. You should be seeing my slides now, hopefully. So as I said, um, I'm going to talk about the Overseas Operations Bill. There's a lot to say on this particular instrument, but I will focus my remarks on those aspects of the bill which deal with the extraterritorial applicability of human rights. So for those who are not familiar with the bill, let me just give you a very quick rundown of what this is all about. The bill itself was introduced roughly about a year ago in March 2020. It has passed through its third reading in the House of Commons, and it is now currently before the House of Lords, where it passed its second reading and is now at the committee stage. So it's very near to, to uh, near and completion. The aim of the bill is to provide greater legal protections to UK service personnel and veterans who are deployed on overseas operations. And I'll say a few words about that in a minute. But the bill has received a lot of criticism, both within the UK as well as internationally. Many commentators have suggested that the bill is essentially conferring impunity on UK armed forces for various offenses, including international crimes such as war crimes, crimes against humanity, 
And quite a number of commentators have also suggested that the bill essentially decriminalizes torture. The UK government has strongly reacted to these claims. It has denied them and uh, essentially in particular sort of put back uh, that claim that the bill somehow decriminalizes torture. It has very strongly denied all of these um, points. So what is the bill about ultimately? As I mentioned, the main aim of the bill is to protect UK service personnel for acts that they may have committed on overseas deployments, and in particular to protect them against what are called vexatious or insufficiently grounded legal claims, and also to protect them from repeated investigations into allegations of wrongdoing. In terms of the political background that has led to the bill, this is very much motivated by the almost flood of litigation that the UK, particularly the MOD, has faced, the Ministry of Defence has faced in, re in relation to its operations in Afghanistan, in Iraq since 2001 and 2003. Uh, a lot of this has been described as, as a reaction to lawfare. The UK has investigated many of these allegations in various formats and fora, uh, for example, in the Al Swedi inquiry. And what a lot of these inquiries have found is that many of the allegations were without merit or at least not with sufficient merit to war warrant a deeper and closer investigation. Having said that, we also have to acknowledge and, and, and indeed uh, not forget that there were not just unfounded allegations that the UK has faced, but certain allegations have in fact been proven to be, uh, um, unfortunately, to be founded. For example, the Baha Musa inquiry. So how does the bill deal with this problem of vexatious litigation and lawfare? There are three key elements to the bill. First of all, it creates a number of obstacles to the prosecution of certain crimes by creating a presumption against the prosecution of alleged offences after five years have passed, by asking prosecutors when considering to bring prosecution or to continue already ongoing um, cases to consider certain matters, and I'll come to them, to them in a moment. And then also thirdly, it requires the consent of the Attorney General for these prosecutions to go ahead after five years have passed since the uh, alleged incident took place. So these three elements, these obstacles to prosecution, are called the triple lock. Then the second major element is that the bill introduces a number of time limits to civil claims, tort claims, but also to human rights claims brought under the Human Rights Act. And then thirdly, there is an obligation now uh, to be imposed on the government to consider derogating from uh, the European Convention on Human Rights under Article 15 of the Convention for significant overseas operations. So in the rest of the time that I have available, I'll uh, have a look at the obstacles to prosecution, so the triple lock, as well as the question of derogations, because both of these raise some interesting questions over the extraterritorial applicability of human rights, in particular, of course, the European Convention on Human Rights. So just Again, a quick look on how this triple lock, these three obstacles to prosecution are meant to work. So there is a general presumption against prosecuting alleged offences, certain offences, after five years have passed since the incident took place. Now, relevant offences are, are only prosecuted in exceptional cases. However, the notion or the concept definition of relevant offensive is extremely broad. Essentially, only sexual offenses or offenses of a sexual nature are excluded, which means that they can be prosecuted in the normal fashion. Everything else, including allegations of war crimes, crimes, crimes against humanity, including torture, are subject to this bar of exception, uh, uh, exceptionalism. The government has maintained that this is not somehow a statute of limitations, that it doesn't provide an amnesty because prosecution remains possible. It is more difficult to prosecute after five years, but at least in principle, prosecution is still possible. Turning to the second element of the triple lock, the prosecutor in deciding whether or not to initiate a prosecution after the five-year period or to uh, maintain ongoing prosecutions will have to take into account a number of matters. First of all, the prosecutor will have to look at what, if any, adverse effects participating in an overseas military operation has had on the accused, in particular the ability of that person to make sound judgments or to exercise self-control and the impact the operation had on their mental health. The prosecutor also has to look at the individual's unique experiences and level of responsibility, and in cases of ongoing investigations, 
if no new compelling evidence has emerged, the public interest in actually closing down the uh, investigation. Now, these three grounds have been criticized heavily by uh, commentators for basically two reasons. First of all, if you look at international criminal law, at least some of these factors, some of these matters are taken into account as a matter of international criminal law, but not as a question as to whether a particular uh, case should go to trial, but rather they're, they're looked at mainly as a way of mitigating circumstances at the uh, sentencing stage to consider the level of culpability of an individual. Whereas, of course, here, what the, what the UK government is proposing is to use these, uh, these criteria to actually um, uh, stop or not to initiate proceedings at all. Some of these matters are not recognized in international criminal law. For example, the idea of mental health as such is not recognized as a miti mitigating circumstance. So we see that this is where a lot of this criticism has come from. Then finally, we have the consent of the Attorney General as the third element of the triple lock, but we don't have to go into detail on that one. So let me bring in very quickly uh, a recent development which links this up with the question of extraterritoriality, which is the case of Hanan. So the Hanan case, as many of you will know, so I will not go into uh, uh, the details of the background of the case, the Hanan case concerned a, uh, an ISAF airstrike against two fuel tankers in Afghanistan in 2009, which killed a large number of civilians. One of the uh, fathers of two boys who were killed in that airstrike brought proceedings first in Germany and then ultimately before the Strasbourg court, relying on the procedural limb of Article 2, arguing that Germany carried out a flawed and ineffective investigation into the airstrike and the role of German forces in uh, launching that airstrike. What is interesting is that Hanan uh, relied on an earlier case, the case of Guzel Yurtlu, to argue that the very fact that Germany launched an investigation into the, uh, the incident was sufficient <clears throat> to create a jurisdictional link for the purposes of Article 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So, in other words, although Hanan did also rely on the idea that the very fact of launching an air strike brought the, uh, uh, the victims within the jurisdiction of Germany, Ultimately, the main, main uh, extraterritorial link that Hanan relied on was the launching of an investigation into the incident. So the court very recently decided the, uh, the Hanan case. It distinguished the facts from the Guzel Yurtu precedent, saying that in Hanan, what we saw was an extraterritorial military operation under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, which took place outside of convention territory. So therefore, the Hanan precedent could not simply be applied. Nevertheless, there are, two exception, there are several exceptional uh, features, which led the courts to nonetheless affirm a jurisdictional link. According to the courts, these special features were the exclusive jurisdiction of Germany under the applicable status of forces agreement over German troops and its duty to investigate allegations of war crimes under both customary international law as well as domestic law. So because of these special features, the court found in Hanan that Germany, by launching an investigation into the incident, had established its jurisdiction. So how does all of that relate to the of, uh, overseas operations bill. Well, essentially what the court has decided in Hanan, and this is, I think, the main consequence, um, is that provided a state retains exclusive jurisdiction over its armed forces on overseas operations, which is very, very, very commonplace. Again, as probably many in the audience will know, and it is subject to a duty to investigate war crimes, which of course all states are as signatories to the Geneva Conventions, then the procedural limb of Article 2 of the Convention is engaged. Essentially, and I pose this as a question, not as a statement, um, but essentially I think we can start asking ourselves whether the European Court in Strasbourg is turning itself into a war crimes tribunal. Um, it is very easy to see how these two, or even three uh, conditions in Hanan could be satisfied, and if they are, then basically Article 2, the procedural limb of Article 2, becomes almost the enforcement arm for the duty that states have to investigate and prosecute allegations of war crimes. So the Overseas Operations Bill comes into the picture insofar as that the triple lock, as we have seen, raises a number of questions, in particular the various matters that prosecutors will have to look at under the second part of the triple lock, 
may not fully comply with the obligations that the UK has in repressing and prosecuting war crimes under the law of armed conflict. If that is the case, then this might violate the procedural limb of Article 2 based on Hanan. So in a roundabout way, we might see a standard of unable or unwilling emerging not before the ICC, where of course this standard already exists, but arguably in Strasbourg, where as a result of Hanan, the court now seems to be willing to uh, use Article 2 and to use the Convention Missionary to uh, oversee how states are complying with their obligation to prosecute war crimes. Very quickly, so let me say a few words <clears throat> on derogations. So the um, bill imposes an obligation on the government to consider derogating for certain types of overseas deployments, those where UK forces may come under attack, face a threat of attack or violent resistance, and where the operation itself is significant. <clears throat> this last um, condition is meant to align the, the duty to consider derogating with the conditions imposed on derogations in Article 15 of the European Convention on Human Rights. As you will know, Article 15 is only applicable, can only be relied on in cases of war or other public emergency threatening the life of a nation. So there's quite a high standard, a high threshold that is required before uh, um, Article 15 can be engaged. Various questions have been asked whether overseas operations would ever actually qualify as a, for this high threshold. If you think about the, um, the recent case between uh, Georgia and Russia, think about Russia. In that particular operation, was the life of the, the, the Georgia operation, was the life of the Russian nation really threatened so that Russia could in fact rely on Article 15? And again, I just pose that as a question. Either way, the, government, the bill imposes an obligation on the government to consider derogating. If the government were to derogate below the threshold of Article 15, uh, then of course the Strasbourg Court would review it and, uh, and would take action accordingly. So if there are any worries about um, perhaps misusing Article 15, the Strasbourg overview and supervision mechanism would, uh, would deal with them. But let me end with asking two questions, um, which are less about the compatibility of derogations foreseen under the bill, but rather with their utility and what purpose they serve. The government has made clear that the main purpose for derogating would be to allow um, derogations from Article 5, the rights to, to liberty, so essentially to deal with detention during armed conflict. But of course, the Hassan case already deals with that. As many, again, of you will know, in the Hassan case, the European Court accepted that Article 5 had to be accommodated with the power to detain in Geneva Convention Number 3 and Geneva Convention Number 4. So it seems to be almost uh, useless and, and uh, to serve no purpose to derogate given the Hassan case. But here again, and, and uh, Ralph might touch on this, um, the, um, the latest case in uh, Georgia and Russia raises some interesting questions. A number of judges there have indicated that they don't think that Hassan would apply to Article 2, right to life, and that derogations are actually, would be required for uh, Article 2. I think that raises a very interesting problem, which uh, I'm not sure has been fully appreciated or at least discussed by commentators, and I'll end on this point um, to, to leave enough time for the other two speakers. And that problem, problem is the following. If derogations have a high threshold, as I have just mentioned, but an international armed conflict can come into existence at a lower threshold, then we may end up in a situation where a state may be engaged in um, use of force, status-based targeting, which is compliant with the law of armed conflict, but cannot actually derogate. But as we have seen, some of the judges in the uh, Russia, uh, Georgia Russia case only accept uh, uh, that Article 2 can be displaced through derogations rather than through the Hassan case. So I leave it there. Uh, there's more to say on these points, but perhaps we can take them up in the Q&A. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a, a pleasure to be uh, joining you today. Um, so, as you know, in January, the Grand Chamber in Strasbourg issued its decision in the second interstate case brought by Georgia against Russia concerning the 2008 war relating to the situation in South Ossetia and Abkhazia, the two entities within Georgia 
that have sought to break away from that state with Russian support. The court distinguished between two phases in the war. First, the active hostilities phase with direct armed conflict between Georgia and Russia in South Ossetia and Georgia and other parts of Georgia. Second, the period after, when there was a ceasefire, Russian troops remained predominantly in South Ossetia and the breakaway administrations of South Ossetia and Georgia, um, Abkhazia were, sorry, were according to the court, supported by Russia to the extent that they depended on this for their survival. The key feature I'll focus on is whether Russia's obligations applied to it. And here, what the court said about the first active hostilities phase. And what the court said about that itself says about the entire subject of the extraterritorial application of human rights law. This is a landmark decision, not only as is commonly understood in setting the limits of extraterritorial applicability, but also because more fundamentally, it sends a message that we need to think about this subject in an entirely different fashion. For treaties that use the term jurisdiction, extraterritorial applicability is determined in two main circumstances. First, effective control over territory, control over an area. Second, effective control over individuals, sometimes called state agent control because of the identity of those who are usually exercising such control. The court's determination of applicability in the post ceasefire phase applied the control over territory test and found that it was met when it came to Russia and the territory of South Ossetia and Abkhazia and the buffer zone between these territories and the rest of Georgia. When it came to the active hostilities phase, I'm going to focus on what the court said about the applicability of human rights law to the use of force. And it found that the convention didn't apply. Separately, the court held that the convention was seemingly applicable in this phase when it came to the uh, procedural obligation to investigate potential unlawful uses of lethal force, and also when it came to the detention of individuals in this context. I won't be addressing those findings. So returning to the question of applicability to the use of force in the active hostilities phase, here the court said that, and I quote, in the event of military operations, including, for example, armed attacks, bombing or shelling, carried out during an international armed conflict, one cannot generally speak of effective control of an area. The very reality of armed confrontation and fighting between enemy military forces seeking to establish control over an area in a context of chaos means that there's no control over an area, end of quote. Because of this, the court considered whether in the alternative, the control over individuals basis for triggering obligations might be met. The court stated that the decisive factor in some of its previous jurisprudence, something one may dispute on this matter, was the exercise of physical power control over the persons in question. It then acknowledged that some of this jurisprudence, as we know, affirmed applicability on this basis arising out of people being shot. But in the words of the court, those cases concerned isolated and specific acts involving an element of proximity. The court went on, and I quote, by contrast, the active phase of hostilities in the context of an international armed conflict is very different, as it concerns bombing and artillery shelling by Russian armed forces seeking to put the Georgian army hors de combat and to establish control over areas forming part of Georgia, end of quote. So the court held because of this that it wouldn't fall within the scope of applicability. So an individual hit by a bullet does come within the effective control of the state whose agent fires the shot for the purposes of the application of the human rights obligations of that state if it is an isolated and specific incident and there is an element of proximity. By contrast, an individual hit by a bullet or other deployed weaponry, such as a bomb, a missile, a shell, etc., does not come within the effective control of the state whose agents deploy this weaponry 
for the purposes of the application of the human rights obligations of that state, if it takes place in the active phase of hostilities of an international armed conflict. Now, obviously, if the test being deployed here was simply concerned with the exercise of control, there would be no difference between the two situations. Being shot still involves being subject to the state's control in either context. So the answer to how the distinction is made and where the border between the two categories lies can't be arrived at with reference to the actual concept control being applied. The court prefaces its finding by revisiting its previous dictum in Bankovich that the question as, as to whether human rights law apply cannot be understood simply in terms of whether or not individuals are adversely affected by the state, something which might therefore cover shooting in any context. For the court, adopting this approach to applicability would be tantamount to adopting the standard that applies in the victim test that determines whether, even if obligations apply, an individual can claim to have suffered a violation of them. Of course, as many of us said at the time when the court made this comment in Mankovic, so what? Every circumstance that might lead to an individual affected to meet the victim test might also meet the applicability test, even if the reverse is not true. To say that it should not, and that therefore the parameters of extraterritorial applicability should be narrower than the parameters of the victim test, and thereby exclude shooting in one context, even if it admits it in another, is a choice. Why then does the court make this choice? Here, of course, we have to remind ourselves how extraterritorial applicability was characterized by the court in Bankovic, repeated as a mantra ever since, including in this decision, as something that is exceptional. The implication is that the exception is a subset of the exceptional extraterritorial activities of states. The uh, states may exceptionally act extraterritorially, but the exceptional application of human rights law to this is not coextensive with its ex exceptional incidence as a matter of fact. It is an exception within the exception, leaving outside of its coverage some of those exceptional activities. But again, why? There isn't anything in the idea of control that helps, as the shooting example indicates. Actually, we have a concept of control over individuals that applies or does not apply on some basis other than the actual existence, absence, or level of control itself. The concept of applicability can be broad or narrow, and the extent of control exercised by the state isn't going to tell us which approach is going to be taken. Actually, control is better understood as something entirely divorced from its actual meaning, indeed concerned with something entirely different, a concept that's flexible not because control can be exercised to different degrees, but because differences in the concept aren't determined by different levels of control at all, but rather by other factors. So what are those factors? We have to develop a jurisprudence on extraterritorial applicability that understands the contours of this according to the broader factors that are actually determinative of what the courts have held to come within or fall outside of the jurisdiction test. So the 2001 Bankovich finding, bombing doesn't constitute effective control to trigger applicability. We should understand this as rooted in a concern following the attacks on 9-11 which happened a month before that decision was issued, that military action would be taken by the US, which at that time was the recipient of considerable global sympathy and its allies in Afghanistan. In this context, the court didn't want to set a precedent for its involvement in such situations. And we must remember, of course, that the bombing of Belgrade that that case was about was a NATO operation. Jump forward to Alskani a decade later, where the court held that the convention applied. We should understand this as reflecting all the human rights concerns raised by the US extraterritorial actions after 9-11 in the war on terror, from black sites to Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib, and the greater mainstream sentiment that redress should be provided, including potentially through human rights review. Then 10 years after that, now, in this case, 
where the approach to applicability seems to flip back to the Bankovic era. Now here, unlike those earlier decisions, we partly get an indication of the broader determinative factors by what the court says in its judgment. Indeed, the court is defensive about the conclusion it's drawn, perhaps reflecting the existence of the pro-accountability climate on extraterritoriality, which led to Alskany. It acknowledges that drawing a conclusion that renders the convention inapplicability in a particular extraterritorial context, and I quote, may seem unsatisfactory to the alleged victims of the acts or omissions by a respondent state in that context. Moreover, the court seems to acknowledge what, it, what has gone on in its jurisprudence, a progressive development of the scope of applicability to respond to accountability concerns. When it then says, seemingly with regret, that despite the fact that potential victims might be disappointed, and I quote, it's not in a position to develop its case law beyond, end of quote, what it said in the jurisprudence to date, and that if the scope of applicability is to go beyond that position, and I quote again, it is for the contracting parties to provide the necessary basis, end of quote. So, of course, this is a remarkable step. A court calls a halt to further jurisprudential development and throws the ball back to states. Given the fundamental significance of this statement, it's perhaps no surprise that as a prelude to it, the court articulates some of those broader factors behind its decision. And in doing so, it drops the pretense that there is a coherent concept of control actually determining applicability. Something else is going on, a series of entirely different determinative factors. The court highlights, and I quote, the large number of alleged victims and contested incidents the magnitude of the evidence produced, the difficulty in establishing the relevant circumstances, and the fact that such situations are predominantly regulated by legal norms other than those of the convention, specifically IHL, end of quote. We should take this as an invitation to engage with the substance of what has been going on throughout the extraterritoriality cases instead of fixating only on the precise ins and outs of what the control test is. Now that the court has been willing to acknowledge the existence of these broader factors, we should appraise what is being said about them. The implication is that these factors concerning volume, complexity, and the application of IHL should act as a bar to applicability. But why? The court can't cope with the volume, and is outside the skill set comfort zone of its members in grappling with the interface with, between human rights law and IHL? If this is the case, then the issue is not about whether human rights law should apply as such, but rather about the limits of, in, of its enforcement at Strasbourg. If so, what are the problems of addressing the latter through the former, addressing enforcement through applicability? Indeed, this invites us to face up to what has been going on in many of these cases. Many of these debates, ostensibly about applicability, are actually about enforcement, not about whether human rights law should apply, but whether there should be remedies. But more fundamentally, and here is where I will end, we shouldn't, of course, take the court's explanation at face value. We know that it's been under immense pressure by states on this general topic, and especially in the context of armed conflict. Might we understand this statement by the court as like the victim of a bully who gives the bully what it wants, but to keep the bully happy has to pretend that this is what it needs, that this is because of its own shortcomings. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me. I will be speaking um, to a recent decision um, on procedural issues in a communication, an individual communication before the UN uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, 
I think it ties what I have to say ties nicely um, into and onto what uh, Ralph has just um, been explaining. Um, particularly, I will say something about uh, the jurisdictional tests or lack thereof as it as they were applied in this decision. And then also um, I will uh, say some things about how, what that tells us about extraterritoriality, um, its function in human rights law, and also perhaps um, about the uh, institutional setups of these bodies, the ECTHR and the CRC and so on, um, uh, and what role it might play in how these bodies respond to questions of extraterritoriality. Now, as uh, Shahid has already uh, hinted um, in the beginning, this decision is uh, the communication it concerns is about children uh, of French nationality and these children are held uh, mostly with their mothers in camps for suspected ISIS, ISIL collaborators in Northern Syria. The detention conditions, and this is undisputed, are deplorable, um, they uh, present uh, and danger of irreparable harm to the health and life of these children and their mothers. Uh, but again, this is a, a children's rights committee decision. So it's mostly about the children here. Uh, the rights invoked include uh, rights to non-discrimination, the right to life, right to health, the right to development. And the demand is of the authors of this complaint. These authors are the grandparents mostly of these children. Um, these grandparents are in France. And the demand is to um, either assist the children, protecting them where they are through consular means uh, or whatever else is available, or ultimately and ideally, as I take it, to repatriate them to France. So the committee now looks at whether it has jurisdiction and because France uh, France's arguments tie this to the question of whether France has jurisdiction, the committee decides here on whether France has jurisdiction. Now, jurisdiction here is used in two different ways um, by the committee um, referring to its own competence and uh, by France as the applicability criterion of, um, uh, of international human rights law, including the, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. There is a lot to be confused about in this decision, including the terminology. Um, and um, I'm just going to say a few things about what the, what the committee found, and then I'm going to provide some analysis of that. So the reasoning is very short. The reasoning of the committee is very short. It's a little over a paragraph. Um, it says um, France has jurisdiction, that's the finding, and um, it relies it doesn't really apply a test, um, I don't think, uh, but it just lists considerations that are relevant and I'm just gonna give these in a reasonably uh, charitable form here. It says uh, jurisdiction is not limited to territory. Uh, that much is uncontroversial, I'd say. Then it says, um, it, it refers to control, but in an earlier paragraph, and then says um, in its own findings, um, acts that are performed inside the state's territory but have effects outside uh, of the state's territories can also trigger jurisdiction. Um, this is a distinction that is not, um, it, it doesn't seem to be very important in a lot of the other case law, but the committee seems to be, seems to be of another view here. Then the state party was notified of the deplorable conditions by the complainants by the authors of the individual commun communication. So knowledge, France's knowledge of this uh, problem of the camps, the conditions of these children uh, was important. Um, then it says further, the detention conditions were deplorable. That seems to be important. And um, the control of these camps was in the hands of a non-state actor, namely the Kurdish forces, the Kurdish authorities having established territorial control in Northern Syria. Um, and uh, these Kurdish authorities say, well, we don't want these children, we don't have the funds or the means to care for them, please, states of nationality, take them back. This is all what the committee says is relevant. And then it lists the nationality of these children, 
and says, well, these children are French. And so France, because of that, you, are thought, you, are to, you have jurisdiction over that. And finally, um, it refers to the capability, capacity and power of France to protect these um, children. Um, the circumstances, again, is that uh, the Kurdish authorities um, are willing to cooperate here. So that adds to the capacity of France. And also, and this is uh, particularly interesting um, if uh, a little perverse, and I will come to that in a second. Uh, France has already repatriated children um, from these camps. Um, now, France says they will deal with it on a case by case basis. Of course, if we do a little bit of digging, we, will, we find that the children France has repatriated are mostly orphans, and the children that are not being repatriated have parents attached to them. Um, I will leave it to you to think about why that might be. Um, now, how does this uh, decision of the committee relate to established case law? Um, as Ralph has pointed out, um, established case law and extraterritoriality um, definitely supports two models of extraterritorial jurisdiction. One based on territorial control, so control over an area, uh, where belligerent occupation is a classic example, and the other one is control over individuals by state agents. And it is fairly obvious that neither of these tests are met by the facts here. France does not control the area where these camps can be found. Uh, France does not control the camps. Uh, France has not expelled the children or their parents. Um, so this has little to do with, Fran with France, right? So obviously these tests, I think is, it is fairly uncontroversial to say that these tests are not met. And presumably because of this then, um, the committee relies on different notions. And now I'm trying to make a little bit more sense of the list that I've given you before. Um, again, reconstructing what the committee has said. Um, it relies on notions of capacity and nationality mostly, right? It doesn't really apply a test, and, um, but it also replies, reply, um, relies on effects of acts outside of, of, of France's territory. So um, this is fairly difficult to apply if we, if we think jurisdiction can be triggered by effects outside a state's uh, territories, but territory, but with acts that have been committed within, then refusal to admit people to the territory of a state, it, it, here this makes no sense, this criterion. Um, why not? It's because we essentially have to say these children are only put in need of protection because a refusal to admit has taken place. And so um, France is um, acquiring jurisdiction, acquiring obligations by violating obligations to protect. But that is not the point. The point is to show that these obligations exist before the refusal to admit somebody to the territory, right? Um, so what about capacity then? France's um, uh, capacity, to help these children is beyond doubt. Of course, France has, to, has all the means to help. France can repatriate these children. France can give funds. France has the means, like, of course. But then to help, to assist, the capacity to assist, we could also say the UK or Germany has that. So capacity in and of itself is not a very good way of expressing who should do something. Now, jurisdiction is not only a threshold criterion for the applicability of human rights law, but it is also um, a criterion that tells us which state has to do something. So a right is not only about something has to be about what has to be done, but also about who has to do it. And jurisdiction is part of that equation. And capacity in and of itself does not really give us that. So just the capacity to say power has the power, uh, France has the power to help, has the capacity to help, to my mind, is not very persuasive because it does not actually act as an allocation criterion or as a threshold criterion. 
And this is where the nationality criterion comes in. This is why, because there are many states that can help. The committee now relies on nationality and says, well, you could help all of the children, but you only have to help yours. Um, only yours are in, uh, in, uh, within your jurisdiction. But this has serious drawbacks. Um, most of all, arbitrariness. Think of uh, children with, say, a mother or two children, different fathers. One of those children is French, the other one is not. Or the children might be French because of their father's nationality, but the mother is not. What do you do with the mother? So the nationality here comes in to make up for the defects in the effects-based approach to jurisdiction and the capacity approach to jurisdiction that the committee both wants to apply here. Um, so, and then finally, um, it's, uh, it's also, I mean, just as a note, note of caution, a general note of caution, if we use the idea that somebody has already helped and therefore now has to help more, like the committee did with France and the repatriations that have already taken place, that is a great way of making sure no help is forthcoming in the future. So the idea here was to broaden the extraterritorial application of human rights but it may not be as human rights friendly as this, this, as this seems. And this brings me to um, my last point, namely with what leaves, with, with what we're left here. So a broadening of human rights um, obligations to extraterritorial contexts um, is, is problematic, normatively, conceptually, and practically speaking, right? Um, because it, it creates uncertainty and in a system where we rely a lot on the goodwill of the duty bearers, the goodwill of states, that can be not desirable, not, not great. Um, then we have two directions of travel generally, and now this links back to what Ralph has said, in the human right, international human rights law adjudication here. So the ECTHR, is backtracking, limiting, again, the extraterritorial reach and UN bodies are broadening the extraterritorial reach of human rights. Um, this is true of the CRC, but there is also a recent, um, uh, there are recent views adopted in January of this year by the Human Rights Committee that uh, in AS and Italy, which, uh, which does the same. So we have two directions of travel. But of course, the UN bodies, the treaty bodies, are very different from the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights issues um, enforceable judgments, um, and uh, it's binding, and in general has more institutional force behind it. So, in a way, the UN um, bodies may have a little bit more room to play with. Um, this is just speculation, but I'm just saying there are, there is a tension here, and the institutional makeup may explain this tension better than the applicable law does. And now finally, maybe the, the most important point to me at least, do I think it is a good idea to repatriate French children to France, French children in this deplorable situation? Of course, of course I do. This is a good idea, it's morally right. It is not very burdensome in the grand scheme of things. And in terms of, in, of national and international security, it is obviously the right choice. But this decision and how it was reached by the CRC shows us that human rights law may not be the answer here. Human rights are limited. They are rights, they are legal entitlements. If we want to take them seriously as such, the duties they impose have to be stringent and well justified. What we really need here for a camp teeming with mothers and children, we're talking thousands, right? What we really need is a, a collective approach, burden sharing, principles of priority, and generally debates about distributive and social justice. And human rights law here in this particular in this particular instance may be crowding out those dialogues that I think would be really, really important to have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to all three of you. Um, 
I'm going to turn turn this open to the to the Q and A. There's a question that's been asked on the Q and A by Nigel Parker. Um, isn't a new protocol to the ECHR the proper and principled way to deal with extraterritorial application as opposed to confusing inconsistent case law? Now, with that thought in mind, um, I have two questions. Um, I'm going to ask Oral the first one, and I'm going to ask Ralph and uh, Leah if she wants to come in on the second one. Um, so the first question, Oral, is this. Um, do you agree with the descending, dissenting judges in Henan that the majority view might well make it possible to preserve a tenable concept of jurisdiction? So if I could ask you to deal with that, and then Ralph and uh, Leah, if you want to come in on this question, which is, bearing in mind Henan and uh, the two decisions from the Committee on the Rights of the Child, is there a danger that with these international tribunals pushing for greater extraterritorial accountability, we're going to see a backlash with countries like the UK uh, contracting their extraterritorial responsibility. So Oral, if I could invite you to go first and then Ralph and uh, Leah, if you want to come in after that. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I, I do find myself uh, in, in agreement with much of what the dissenting judges do say in, uh, in Hanan. I, I don't really think that Hanan tackles Article 1 at all. I mean, it, it, uh, it applies the procedural obligation or procedural limb of, of Article 2 without actually looking at Article 1, uh, which, which puts the, the cart before the horse, which is exactly one of the criticisms that the dissenting judges have made. And I, I find myself in agreement. I think there are two issues with Hanan. One is, how did the court reach that uh, conclusion that it reached. And I think if you look at the uh, Guzel Yorto case, um, I, I don't see how from that case, the various arguments flow that the court has used. So I don't find the reasoning particularly compelling. And again, for those who are interested, I, I refer you to the dissenting uh, uh, judgment or opinion because, because that I think it explains some of the pitfalls in the reasoning really, really well. But there's a broader issue. Uh, as I suggested, it seems to be the case that the court is kind of setting itself up as a review body for war crimes allegations. Uh, this may not be deliberate, maybe the court is not there yet, but that seems to be the kind of general trend. And of course, the court has already looked at uh, war crimes allegations in the past, the Chechen cases, but this seems to be a lot more explicit now. I think that's uh, sort of a major development that we are seeing here. And I'm somewhat ambivalent about that. Uh, of course, how could anyone disagree with the idea that enforcing war crimes prosecutions and, and increased supervision, which we don't have under the law of armed conflict, is a bad thing? It's not a bad thing. It is a good thing. But I wonder whether the European Court is the right place uh, to, to actually have these discussions and the right body to, to undertake that supervision. And this takes me to a question that uh, Ed Bates has raised in the, uh, the Q&A where he's, he's asking, uh, doesn't the European court actually defer to the standards of the law of armed conflict uh, when it comes to, to investigations? Doesn't it actually apply more relaxed standards? Well, the court does, at least on paper. So if you look at al Skaini, if you look at the various cases afterwards, the court always says it is mindful of the context. But the reality, I think, paints a somewhat different picture. Uh, if you look at Jalut, for instance, the court uh, faulted the Netherlands for not separating the soldiers after the incident has taken place. It faulted the Netherlands for not essentially confiscating the weapons. That just doesn't reflect the operational reality that you have in military operations. Say you have an incident where a drone was, bomb was dropped by an aircraft and an investigation has to be launched. Are you now going to ground that aircraft because it's the weapon that has been used to commit the incident? It's just nonsensical. So I'm not sure the court always uh, or fully takes into account the operational uh, realities in the way uh, it it should, so I'm I'm slightly worried about this, and in that sense, I'm I'm ambivalent. Uh, and then, if you look at the Hanan case itself, yes, the court has has found that Germany did carry out an effective investigation, but this is an incident which has almost unprecedented scrutiny, numerous reports, a an almost 600-page parliamentary report. I mean, this has been investigated beyond above and beyond rightly so, but this is not your normal war crimes investigation. Um, so I'm, I'm somewhat worried that the court is applying standards that do not take into account operational realities. And by the way, and I finish on this one, this I think is exactly some of what is driving the, uh, uh, the UK Overseas Operations Bill. Uh, 
Thank you, Oral. Ralph, if I could invite you to come in in response to the question I posed. Sure. So, so um, should there be a protocol um, on extraterritorial applicability, and and how do, how do we think it would uh, consider the concerns about a potential backlash following these? jurisprudential developments which seem to have, at least until recently, uh, pushed in a particular direction, uh, uh, notably, of course, now with the Human Rights Committee as well and the um, uh, inter-American um, human rights bodies. So I think, forgive me, that our international participants, if I make an observation rooted in the UK uh, experience in particular, um, we have to remember uh, from, certainly from the UK, that this is part of a broader issue, which is uh, human rights law having been introduced and applicable to the UK originally in the colonial period on the basis that this would, would be, these would be standards that the UK would promote in other places in the world, that they wouldn't be necessary and relevant to the UK itself, whether in its own territory or extraterritorially. And of course, then we have the rude shock uh, for people with that viewpoint that, of course, the main generator of jurisprudence at Strasbourg turned out to be cases brought against the UK, uh, revealing deficiencies actually within the UK system for human rights protection. We then, of course, get the Human Rights Act, which sought to domesticate these protections. But what we never had in the UK, and this may be a, uh, a story that could be told in other jurisdictions in, in the Council of Europe, is a, a proper effort by politicians to make the case for this importance of human rights protection. And this led to the popular perception of human rights protection as an elite project as something disconnected from the lives of ordinary people. And of course, enabled all of the various myths that we're very familiar with about what human rights law requires, that it's somehow a series of absolute protections that can't be balanced against other considerations, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to think about this in that context, that the very commitment of the polity to human rights protection in law is fragile and should not be taken for granted. The, 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 the Labour Party has essentially sought to do this by stealth without seeking to make the case for these protections. The Conservative Party has been actively hostile to them. Uh, we remember um, pre-Brexit the commitment made by, um, for example, Theresa May, remember her when she was standing to be leader of the Conservative Party, she said she wanted to scrap the Human Rights Act and withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights. And as it turned out, that never happened, uh, that was never formally put by her in the uh, manifesto for the general election, uh, because it was felt that there would be too much to do uh, with all of what would be necessary legally to implement Brexit. Brexit's happened. What's next? There is another European court, which of course popularly is confused with the European Court of Justice, and those who are against this entire project are now saying, hold on a minute, haven't we left these European uh, systems of external scrutiny? How is it that we're still subject to uh, another one? And we have to take that very seriously and consider, therefore, the fragility of the continued commitment by certain states, including the UK, to be part of the system. Brexit should be a wake up call for the complacency of those, I take my, I include myself in this, who uh, imagine that these things, once established and adopted, uh, would, of course, never uh, be uh, withdrawn from it's time to move away from that. So Shahid, I think you're asking me to wrap up. So what I would just <laughs> say then is that, that prisoner voting, non-reformal, extraterritorial applicability, particularly in relation to armed forces, are the very flashpoint issues, right, that are at the heart of this potential backlash, which could lead to withdrawal. 
and therefore the issues are at stake in the, on this topic of extraterritoriality are acute. And um, it, it, I, I do think that that is something which has to be borne in mind uh, when everyone concerned, whether it's judges in Strasbourg, whether it's activists, whether it's people um, bringing these cases, think about what is at stake in seeking to somehow avoid having to make the political case for human rights protection and simply go for endless uh, cases and pushing things through the fiat of a judicial decision. Um, sorry, Shahid. Not at all. Thank you very much, Ralph. Um, I want to just turn to Leah and Leah, I want to ask you the question I asked Ralph about the danger of, of a backlash, but I also see that there are several questions for you in the Q&A um, and, and many of them raising the, the Shemaima Begum case. Um, Saeed Bagheri has said France is just one of dozens of countries that have justifications to refuse to repatriate the IS children. The actual example is national security, which the UK Supreme Court has already relied on in the Begum case. And he asks, how should we deal with basic freedoms from on the one hand and national security on the other? So if you could deal with that, but also any observations on uh, the backlash question too, please. Um, okay, thank you. So um, the backlash question first. Um, so yes, I, I think there is a danger of that, that, that at least in the UK we're already um, seeing. Um, what else can be done, like other than narrowing the scope of the, the law again? Um, one way of maybe mitigating this, and this is really, I'm pleading with uh, any human rights adjudicating bodies here, whether courts or not, um, please, please, please reason well. I think inconsistent reasoning um, and not being clear about what test is applied and why uh, in order to, to reach a result that seems morally or perhaps even legally desirable is just not, it's not a good idea, I don't think. Um, and um, when you're, so, so when, when, when you're reliant on this, the goodwill of your subjects, in this case states, um, it's particularly important that if you want them to do something, you need to explain well why you think they ought to. Um, it doesn't always work, but it would be one thing that courts and uh, UN bodies could do um, short of um, withdrawing into, oh, this is lawmaking, we, we don't do this, right? But, but there is scope to, to make the reasoning better, and I would, I would like to see that personally. Then the Shemaima Begum case. So um, I would like to distinguish the facts first uh, from the repatriation issue um, for children. So the Begum case is in a way different because it seems to me that for the purposes of deprivation of citizenship, the argument for extraterritorial jurisdiction over uh, Shemaima Begum is very much stronger because it is the UK initia in, in, in initializing a procedure to deprive her of her rights that establishes the link here. It's not her making an application, right? So um, what this suggests to me is that it actually makes sense to include, there were a few questions on the role of nationality generally, to include nationality in our thinking because there are some rights like rights connected to citizenship, protected, for, exa for example, in the ICCPR, voting and so on, that can only be exercised together with citizenship. And so in this particular instance, uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction over citizens, even if they're abroad, uh, might be a good idea and is actually very well justifiable. Um, and the national security um, balance question, I absolutely agree um, that the question here is national security. I mean, this is, this is the, the issue the CRC does not deal with in its decision. It just says, oh, this is, these are poor children, but of course, neglecting the fact that it is not politically um, desirable or easy to repatriate children with their mothers and the mothers are suspected 
to still harbor sympathies for ISIL. This is very difficult to do, right? And national security is an easy justification here. Now, having said that, the Begum case in general is much, much more um, important and interesting for the national security question, not just extraterritorially, but also domestically speaking. And especially the recent Supreme Court judgment is actually is, is much more interesting in that context. Uh, I worry about it, not because of its ramifications for extraterritoriality. As I said, I think the facts can be very clearly distinguished from the repatriation, repatriation uh, cases. Um, but um, it's because it takes, I worry about it because it takes such a deferential approach, assuming that there is democratic accountability of national security legislation and secondary instruments that, that there just isn't. So that, that worries me, but I don't think the Begum case, even though of course it springs to mind, um, is, is so uh, relevant for the extraterritorial application. Um, uh, but having said all of that, uh, I mean, these camps are, it's an abomination that we allow this to happen, right? And of course, solutions ought to be found. Um, and I would not want to discourage nationality as an advocacy tool here, but there is a difference um, between using human rights and anything we have in our arsenal in this discourse and language as an advocacy tool um, and using them as instruments of law in, in legal proceedings. And so um, maybe that's the crux that um, we have lost that battle a long time ago that human rights now mean so many things and it's almost impossible to, to, to bridge that gap. Thank you. Um, well, I think we're out of time, although there are lots of interesting points that are being raised on, on the Q&A, but unfortunately, we're going to have to stop there. I just want to say thank you very much to our three excellent panellists and also to Bickle, to Kristen and Liam again for making today's event possible. And thank you all of you for participating. Thank you very much. <laughs>